You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's late evening in Seoul, but we're delighted to have you wherever you're uh, watching on live stream YouTube or on the Zoom call. Uh, the East West Center in Washington is delighted to have uh, Dr. Sung Ho Shin with us today on the topic of the 70th anniversary of the Korean War and inter-Korean relations at a crossroads. This is the first in our series of what we call 60 Minutes for the East West Center 60th anniversary. It's a new series of virtual seminars that we're initiating today and we're absolutely delighted to have Dr. Sung Ho Shin uh, be our inaugural speaker in this series. And this is a series that marks the number of alumni uh, authors, uh, participants in various East-West Center programs, uh, particularly those in the East-West Center in Washington. And Dr. Sang Ho Shin was a uh, visiting fellow with us, and therefore we're just really delighted to, to have him back for this special series. Let me just say that uh, this timing couldn't be better for this. Not only is this the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War, but I had uh, slipped my mind that it was the 20th anniversary of the first meeting between Kim Dae-jung and Kim Jong-il. And of course, contemporary events too, such as the publication of a memoir or autobiography by Mr. Bolton uh, here in the US has raised additional contemporary issues about the state of the US-Korea alliance, inter-Korean relations, and US relations with North Korea. And I could think a few people better than to bring all these together and to give us a perspective from Seoul than Dr. Shin. As many of you know, he's a professor at Seoul National University. He's the director of the International Center, uh, Security Center there at the Graduate School. He's had a number of visiting appointments at US and other institutions, Brookings, East West Center, others. And he's also been an advisor to the uh, various parts of the Korean government. So he brings just a wealth of, uh, of, of information, analysis, um, and network that will inform his talk today. Uh, the ground rules are very simple. Um, we'll use the chat and Q&A functions when, uh, after Dr. Shin completes his prepared remarks. He's going to take us through a PowerPoint for 30 or 40 minutes. We're also recording live on YouTube this session, and therefore questions, um, um, when they do arise at, the, at that point in the program, I will read them for the very simple reason that um, those on YouTube cannot see the, um, the questions on the Q&A or the chat function. So with that, let me again welcome you as the inaugural speaker for the 60 Minutes for the 60th Anniversary series, uh, Sang Ho. And please uh, inform us uh, for the next 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll take Q&A and discussion. Welcome. And welcome to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Satulume, uh, my good friend, <laughs> always. And uh, first of all, congratulations on your 60th anniversary of East West Center, which is uh, quite remarkable. And, uh, and also launching of this uh, new uh, webinar or web seminar series of 60 Minutes. And I'm uh, greatly honored that I'm, I, I didn't know that I, I'm the first one to go on this uh, seminar series. You, so it is again my, uh, my, my great honor. And, uh, uh, and also for those who are joining for this uh, session, uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, attention. Um, as as uh, Satu just mentioned, uh, maybe uh, uh, the main reason why I got to invited to this, uh, you know, prestigious seminar is that the timing. Uh, as he said, uh, uh, this is not only the 70th anniversary of the Korean War, uh, which took place uh, in back in 1950, uh, and then uh, went on until 1953. So this is the 70th anniversary. At the same time, back in 2000 we had a first history meeting uh, between uh, the leaders uh, of, of two Koreas, between President Kim Dae-jung then, and then uh, the chairman uh, Kim Jong-il of North Korea. And uh, not only that, the thing is, uh, it's also those two events uh, took place in June, which is uh, right now. 
Mm. And in particular, uh, the Korean War uh, took place uh, June 25th. So uh, uh, for every Korean, I, I guess both for North and South Koreans, June 25th uh, means very special. It's like a 9-11 for American people. So whenever we hear uh, June 25th, it just reminds me of the Korean War, even though it happened such a long time ago. And that June 25th is just two days before. So today is uh, June uh, 23rd. Mm. So that's uh, another uh, quite interesting timing of this seminar. And also uh, that uh, uh, first inter-Korean summit between the two leaders took place also June. That was uh, June 15th. So it was about uh, 10 days ago. So as I will uh, uh, say in this my uh, uh, video clip, and the timing of uh, what's happening on the Korean Peninsula, uh, as my title shows, the Korea uh, inter-Korean relations at a crossroad. Uh, everyone knows that not only uh, before uh, uh, Mr. Bolton's uh, book came out, uh, the Korea had uh, some tense you know, uh, uh, moment of uh, 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 escalating tension between the two Koreas. So uh, uh, let me get into, uh, with that kind of background, let me get into my uh, 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 presentation and topic uh, today. Uh, please allow me using my uh, PowerPoint slide for my uh, presentation for about maybe half hour. Uh, so uh, I will uh, share my PowerPoint from now on. Uh, on, and in, just in case, if you cannot hear my voice uh, clearly, sometimes it happens uh, due to weak uh, internet link, then I will turn off my own uh, video uh, so that you can have a clear uh, voice uh, from my uh, presentation. But anyway, let me just try both my uh, PowerPoint uh, and presentation. Okay. Great, we can see it. Yeah. You can see it on the full screen now? Yes, yes we can. Excellent. Uh, I got some few slides, but uh, it's mostly uh, photos and uh, interesting pictures, so I will go uh, very fast. Uh, like I said, this is the 70th anniversary of Korean War, and but at the same time, 20th anniversary of this first inter-Korean uh, summit between these two leaders. And again, uh, so, uh, so South Korea was uh, uh, celebrating this uh, uh, inter-Korean summit, uh, especially this is a, a, a 20th anniversary, uh, so sp it's a special meaning for inter-Korean uh, engagement reconciliation process. So we call it uh, June uh, 15th, uh, you know, uh, two Korea's joint statement and uh, you know, peace movement. As you can see, this is uh, that uh, one uh, ceremony of those uh, 20th anniversary uh, held by the governing party. So there has been, in, in fact, uh, three uh, meetings uh, between the two different uh, leaders. I mean, in case of North Korea, it's been a, uh, the first two meetings uh, was Kim Jong-il, but the uh, uh, South Korean uh, president was first Kim, Jong, uh, Kim Dae-jung, and then there was a uh, Lo mu Hyun in between. But then uh, uh, 2018, there was a Moon Jae-in, uh, President Moon, a meeting with uh, the son of uh, late chairman Kim Jong-il, uh, Kim Jong-un, just two years ago. So the, this year, the, the, the Korean, South Korean government tried to put up a kind of quite an effort to commemorate this historic uh, reconciliation movement and uh, meeting between the two leaders. So as you can see, this is the President Moon giving a kind of uh, you know, uh, speech, uh, 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 praising uh, how important it is uh, to keep this momentum going, uh, the, especially these uh, two leaders first meeting laid the groundwork for the peace on the Korean Peninsula, etc. And uh, as you can see, one uh, note is uh, he's wearing a tie that uh, was the same with uh, the tie that uh, President Kim Dae-jung uh, wore 20 years ago. In fact, it's the same tie. So he asked uh, uh, President Kim Dae-jung's family uh, to borrow, uh, to lend this tie uh, for him so that he can wear it and send some kind of message to North Korea. 
This was uh, especially uh, because uh, right before this June uh, 15 uh, ceremony, as you know, already there has been some tensions uh, was escalating between the North and South, in particular coming from the North Korea's very harsh critique about uh, recent uh, incident in the you know, uh, DMZ and all that. So uh, starting from early this year, actually uh, back in March, suddenly North Korean uh, authority was uh, you know, saying and blaming South Korea for not uh, keeping the promise of this uh, joint statement. And uh, we are not doing enough for the inter-Korean uh, engagement. And we are just listening to Americans uh, and we are becoming a studio of, uh, you know, puppet of American imperialism and et cetera, et cetera. And those kind of, you know, rhetorics are not uh, uh, new, but why now? I mean, uh, this was the kind of uh, question for especially the current government because they've been, uh, they saw the doing best to promote uh, inter-Korean engagement and the peace between the two Koreas. But the thing is, uh, right after, one day after that uh, 20 years uh, of uh, ceremony, June 16th, as you know, North Korea's uh, authority blew up uh, this, the symbol of inter-Korean uh, engagement that was uh, built under this current uh, President Moon Jae-in's leadership, which was a joint liaison office uh, between in, uh, two Koreas which was built inside uh, Kaesong, uh, the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which is, by the way, right now uh, shut down since uh, the President Park Geun-hye's administration over uh, some kind of uh, escalation of tension between the two Koreas. Anyway, so this is a photo of that uh, event, uh, North Korean blowing up. Uh, the, in fact, uh, they uh, uh, issued a statement saying already, in fact, uh, a few years before, uh, few days before that they are going to do this, but nobody expected actually they are literally going to blow up this building, but which they did, okay? So this is the uh, location of those uh, Kaesong uh, industrial complex. And uh, this is uh, uh, the, the building that was uh, blown up by North Korean authority. And so the timing especially was uh, quite uh, uh, interesting because they just did it maybe intentionally, um, to sabotage maybe South Korea's effort to keep this uh, peace momentum going on under the current government. So uh, let me, uh, the, the first uh, uh, part of my uh, uh, speech, let me uh, ask uh, the three uh, question here, uh, the why at this moment uh, now, and second, especially that uh, uh, harsh uh, rhetoric came from the Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong why she has become a spokesperson for this uh, uh, tension and, uh, and uh, what's next. So let me uh, briefly uh, go over this uh, first. And then, uh, so as you can see the why uh, now, why now? Uh, is it a, so, such a sudden move or maybe uh, uh, we could expect uh, North Korean uh, harsh behavior already when uh, there was a, a, a broken meeting uh, broken deal between the President uh, uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un uh, last year in Hanoi. Uh, there was a much expectation about a more concrete deal between these two leaders, but at the last minute, uh, it just uh, there was no deal and uh, it ended uh, as a failure and uh, which uh, gave a huge kind of uh, setback for especially uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, desire to you know, move things up uh, with the uh, United States and all those, you know, uh, lifting the uh, economic sanction and all that. And then still uh, there was some uh, hope that maybe this still could work out some kind of uh, uh, settlement over this denuclearization issue and lifting of sanction and, you know, all those things. But, uh, you know, right now at this moment, nothing has happened uh, since that uh, February 2000. So there has been always this kind of a growing uh, frustration, anger uh, from the North Korean part. And uh, everybody was expecting maybe they, they will do something about this current situation. Indeed, they issued uh, several warning already. Uh, if uh, there was nothing happens, we will go back to you know, uh, our own nuclear program. We will restart our missile launch and all kinds of threats. 
So in a way, there has been already certain expectation of North Korean uh, provocation. But at the same time, uh, what people are uh, also uh, speculating in, uh, the, especially why then now, after one and a half, more than one and a half years of those kind of period, uh, one uh, theory is that uh, due to this recent uh, pandemic, the COVID situation, the economic situation uh, uh, in North Korea is getting really, really difficult in terms of the you know hard currency and money flow going into the regime, but also general you know uh, shortage of food and all kinds of things. Of course, the North Korean themselves, the uh, two things they said: uh, first uh, measure they did, uh, they shut up the border completely, shut down their border. Uh, of course, North Korea itself is very much isolated regime. But yet, uh, still, uh, they were very much rely on the trade, uh, border trade, especially with China. And still, they by themselves completely shut down those uh, uh, northern uh, border with China. That means uh, their trade uh, uh, exchange with the Chinese has been dried up. And that uh, contradicts their claim in that uh, thanks to that kind of drastic measure, there is no uh, you know, uh, coronavirus. North Korea is a very clean country, but as you can see from this photo, then why all those generals surrounding Kim Jong-un is wearing masks? This was back in already March. So there's a speculation, uh, maybe the, there's a, a certain um, infections and the COVID situation going on in North Korea. And if that's the case, especially North Korean uh, medical uh, situation and society is very vulnerable to those kind of uh, infectious disease. And, and uh, another speculation was, and uh, since then the problem was Kim Jong-un was not showing up. And uh, we already went through that uh, since the uh, kind of the CNN broadcast, maybe there is a kind of Kim Jong-un stats about this. Uh, if you remember about a month ago, all those speculations, where is he? Is he dead or is he in a coma or serious situation? But then suddenly he showed up, right? Uh, and uh, that was the May 4th, already of more than a month ago, showing that uh, to the world that he is well and uh, alive and well and healthy. But uh, still, uh, the, uh, the, the whole situation is usually he gives like a 20 or 30 uh, on-site inspection uh, in those time uh, in the last year in the uh, April or March. But this year he didn't, uh, his uh, public appearance only was like less than five times, including this uh, May 1st uh, uh, kind of cutting of uh, opening of a new fertilizer plant in North Korea. So still there's a, Lots of speculation, maybe there's uh, something going on within the regime. Uh, maybe it's uh, really the COVID situation is so serious. He doesn't want to you know, uh, mingle with the general public, but not only that, he is not sure about who is infected. And if that's the case, he's just hiding in some uh, secret place, uh, waiting for the time until this situation is over. But anyway, but another thing is uh, then why uh, one uh, that rare moment of his public uh, appearance was uh, was about the uh, opening this uh, new uh, fertilizer plant. That means his economic focus has been about uh, how to provide a food supply, and that means that maybe there is a serious food shortage going on along with the general economic uh, uh, hardship in North Korea. And there is a kind of recent numerous report that uh, under the, this current uh, you know, uh, COVID situation, not only the trade uh, itself is uh, in, in, in very difficult uh, situation for North Korea and along with the uh, supply of hard currency, but the food itself is in a great, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 very grave uh, situation, food uh, situation in North Korea right now. So, uh, if you uh, combine all those, maybe North Korea felt like uh, enough is enough. We have waited uh, enough. Uh, if nothing happens with uh, Americans, uh, they are still expecting some kind of uh, uh, aid or supply or economic uh, activity from the South. But uh, from their perspective, South Korean 
uh, we are not doing uh, enough either. There is no hope. Maybe uh, they think this is time uh, for them to do something, uh, to just, you know, uh, a lot of people, uh, they are very serious about it. And uh, maybe, so this is a act of kind of desperation, or another uh, brinkmanship, the, the typical North Korean, you know, uh, way of doing uh, things, stirring up the things so that uh, they get, can get the attention from both uh, Washington and Seoul. Um, so that's a first uh, a part of why now, what's happening, and what could be the motivation of those. But then uh, another related question is, but then those harsh language and very aggressive uh, criticism on South Korean authority is coming from the Kim Yo Jong's uh, personal statement. Right? And the question is, Kim Yo Jong used to be a symbol of this inter-Korean reconciliation. She was the kind of uh, uh, representative of North Korea's what somebody calls smile diplomacy, right? And so when she came to the South uh, during the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic in back in uh, two years ago, back in uh, 2018, it was just a, it created such a new image of North Korean leadership. Oh this new and young lady and came to uh, South Korea and uh, behaved very normally and nicely with all the other uh, her counterpart. And since then, she has become really the symbol of those inter-Korean you know, uh, reconciliation, meeting with all kinds of important uh, South Korean officials. But not only that, uh, uh, she uh, you know, cultivated very uh, you know, uh, good uh, personal relationship with President Moon and his wife. Whenever there was a public appearance, they were showing, uh, uh, coming out together and shaking hands. But then suddenly she has become a spokesperson for you know, North Koreans attacking uh, South Korea. And uh, also she uh, used uh, many kind of uh, uh, bad language, uh, directly calling South Korean uh, President Moon Jae-in as a kind of uh, barking dog or some uh, stupid person. So those are kind of general uh, uh, puzzle. Why then suddenly uh, she became uh, so hostile to uh, uh, South Korean authority? We can understand North Korean military spokesperson saying such a thing. But this is uh, one of the maybe most important figure in North Korean uh, leadership. Uh, she is the uh, key, uh, not only a uh, sister of uh, uh, Chairman Kim, but she has been always, you know, uh, uh, be the key person in any kind of uh, Kim Jong Un's, you know, handling of uh, those foreign uh, uh, counterpart. Uh, not only South Korean president, but also whenever Kim Jong Un goes to China, meeting with uh, President Xi Jinping, or when she, uh, when Kim Jong Un met with uh, uh, President uh, Trump, she was always following uh, Kim Jong Un as almost like a shadow uh, figure, um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, providing and uh, arranging everything. So, a uh, uh, person of such a kind of stature you know, uh, coming out and uh, uh, saying such a kind of language was a kind of such a drastic turn. So there's a, some speculation what's going on. Is it just, uh, uh, this is a little too much. Huh? Mm. So uh, there are a couple of uh, speculation in South, uh, South Korean expert uh, these days. One is that maybe uh, there's something Kim is preparing uh, for uh, some kind of contingency. If something happens to him, who is going to uh, succeed his uh, position. Uh, lots of people, maybe uh, she is the very natural person as uh, one, uh, what they call the Kim family uh, bloodline, right? A uh, key figure at the moment. So uh, maybe they are trying to promote her as a kind of another uh, uh, next uh, leader and in doing so, she wants to, she needs to establish herself as a kind of very strong person, right? Uh, inside uh, North Korean politics. So maybe she's, uh, that's one of the region or, 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 or there could be some other, uh, 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 maybe uh, behind uh, uh, another, uh, or the second theory uh, some people also has is, 
this is maybe these two uh, brother and sister playing a good cup and bad cup. And the thing is, uh, so far Kim Jong Un, uh, there has no direct statement came out of Kim Jong Un yet. Of course. Uh, people are wondering where about what Kim Jong-un is up to, what is he doing. So uh, the thing is, even uh, in the last March, when Kim Yo-jong uh, issued a kind of first statement uh, uh, criticizing, blaming South Korean authority, the next day, Kim Jong-un sent a very uh, interesting letter to South Korean Blue House saying that, oh, I'm very worried about the uh, COVID situation in South Korea. I wish uh, all the best for the South Korean people in overcoming this coronavirus situation and all that. And there could be some collaboration between in, uh, the two Koreas about overcoming this pandemic situation. So this was a kind of such a drastic uh, contrast and turn in between these two uh, statements coming out of these two persons. And then, of course, South Korean authority back in March took only the very positive message. They say, oh, Kim Jong-un was, uh, Kim Yo-jong, uh, uh, after all, uh, it is the Kim Jong-un who makes the final decision. So we will only uh, uh, put uh, importance on uh, care of what Kim Jong-un says. Uh, that means whatever Kim Yo-jong says or any other people says is not important. So uh, maybe they are also you know, uh, trying to create that kind of another drastic moment of after Kim Yo-jong uh, raising the tension and blaming South Koreans for not doing enough and then sudden uh, 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 change of mood and Kim Jong-un shows up and still, oh, okay, I, I still wants to have a good partnership with President Moon. So that's a kind of another uh, 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 speculation uh, maybe the, these two people are playing again, uh, good cup or bad cup, uh, 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 you know. But anyway, the the third question is then what comes next? Okay, so we haven't heard anything yet from Kim Jong Un yet. So obviously, uh, it's not uh, the the timing that uh, the, the the Kim Jong Un will suddenly send another. Uh, a letter to President Moon or saying that I want to go back to, you know, old uh, good days of this inter-Korean dialogue. We, there is no such a kind of a movement yet. Instead, uh, those Koreans, uh, Kim Yo-jong in the, her previous uh, statement, uh, she laid out the several steps uh, uh, for the, those Korea will take from now on. The first step was the blowing up those uh, a, a building, uh, Liaizhong office, which they did. Second step she warned was they are going to remilitarize. They are going to send in those military units back into Kaesong and Kumgang Mountain, which was the symbol of inter-Korean economic cooperation. Which, by the way, th those two locations itself is very important strategic point uh, when it comes to military uh, uh, invasion uh, from the north to south. So uh, that's a uh, could be very symbolic uh, uh, movement. The second, they also said they're going to bring back the, all those military posts uh, in uh, uh, DMG. And also quite uh, interestingly, they, are going to, they said, since one of the direct reason why they are so angry suddenly is that uh, they say uh, South Korean authority did not stop the North Korean defectors sending those reflect to the North Korea uh, uh, you know, blaming and criticizing uh, Kim Jong-un, which they say that he is a great leader. How, how dare you can criticize our dear leader and how dare you South Korean authority let that happen, right? So that was the very uh, uh, direct uh, reason they, uh, they say why they are so angry. And, uh, as, a re uh, and uh, as a kind of revenge, they said, we are also going to you know, wage a leaflet war. We are going to send the, tens of thousands of reflect, you know, mocking uh, President Moon and all that. So there's a kind of interesting dynamic. I mean, they're saying quite strong language and uh, they're saying they're very angry, but so far all these measures doesn't really, uh, to me, uh, 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 reaches the level of very seriousness that we used to see. Uh, when there was a kind of uh, inter-Korean uh, 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 tension and conflict. 
So uh, we will see how, how far they will go, but it, it could happen uh, in the coming days. And indeed, there is some sign of their taking those uh, uh, further steps. And of course, the South Korean uh, response this time has been quite uh, uh, strong. And they issued uh, this time, and uh, it is very, uh, we uh, deeply regret, we are troubled, and it's not good for the inter-Korean relations. And the current uh, tension is all the uh, North Korea's responsibility and if indeed there is any kind of action, uh, concrete action taken against uh, South Korea, we will also take very strong uh, measures against those. So they issued quite unusually strong uh, response to North Korean authority. So that's why at the moment, the, the, everybody is kind of a little bit anxious uh, what will happen. Is, is it uh, going to be a return to those uh, pre-peace uh, uh, movement between the two countries, like uh, going back to the fall or, or, or of 2017, when there was a war of uh, uh, wars between the US and uh, North Korea over this nuclear test, the missile test, President Trump saying uh, North Korea, we will completely destroy North Korea those rocket men in a, in a, a suicide mission, a rocket loaded, and those kind of situation, right? So uh, that's kind of uh, uh, things where we are uh, at the moment. So uh, that's why uh, I said uh, one of the title was, at this juncture, we are at the crossroad, uh, uh, the inter-Korean relations at, at a crossroad. By the way, the time goes quite uh, fast, and then I will, I will try to finish a wrap it up within 10 hours, uh, uh, not 10, 10 minutes, sorry. So, but the thing is, if you look back at what happened over the past year, uh, three years on the, the President Moon, uh, the President Moon from the very beginning of his office in the, uh, you know, uh, back in 2017, he took a very aggressive peace drive. This is uh, uh, except from his speech in Germany uh, back in 2017 in July. This was the moment when there was, a, uh, again, there was a very serious uh, military tension between US and North Korea uh, at the time. And people were expecting there could be a, a, a shootout and bloody nose operation on the Korean Peninsula. In that case, there could be full scale war, those kind of uh, spec speculation. And then President Moon uh, went to uh, Berlin and he said, this is the only one thing that we want. And uh, we want the Korean Peninsula with no threat of nuclear weapon and war. And importantly, coexisting two Koreas based on mutual recognition and respect, right? So since then, but of course still, people at that time said, no, no, there are going to be a war. Lots of people were expecting, talking about the possible war on the Korean Peninsula, right? Um, until the end of uh, 2017. The tensions was quite high, as uh, Mr. Trump was talking about looting this bloody nose operation back in se uh, 17. But then things began to change, right? Drastically, if you, you know, remember, starting from early 2018 with uh, this Pyeongchang Olympic, with Kim Jong-un suddenly New Year's uh, statement, uh, we wish well a success, all the success for Pyeongchang. And then he began to you know, send his delegation, North Korean uh, uh, athlete. And as you can see, the Kim Yo-jong was here uh, in the opening ceremony, along with uh, Vice President Mike Pence, along with uh, Prime Minister Abe. What a, what a change, right? And then we all know what happened, this uh, another uh, the interesting summit at Panmunjom in the April after this Pyeongchang. In between there are lots of things were happening, lots of symbolic, and then in this, the first summit between these two, uh, Moon and uh, Kim, they came out with the Panmunjom declaration, which was uh, quite interesting in a sense that they talk about that the number one item was complete denuclearization. And this never happened in previous two summit. Kim Dae-jung summit with Kim Jong-il and uh, Noh Moo-hyun summit with Kim Jong-il. 
North Korea always refused to talk about nuclear issue with the South Korean counterpart. They always say nuclear issue, we are going to only discuss it with Americans. South Koreans, you are not the worthy of this uh, security discussion. We can engage, we can talk about economic exchange, but not the security issues with the South Koreans. But this was the first time that North Korean leaders agree to talk about denuclearization with the South Korean counterpart. That in and itself was a quite an important change. And I think this was one of the key. And then of course they talk about, for example, and, uh, ending the end of Korean War declaration within in that uh, 2018 and uh, uh, trying to build a, a, a multilateral uh, talks for the permanent peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. Okay, and then all the other things. So Moon has been focusing on this peace and yes, it seems like it was a happening. Uh, not only they had the summit, but unbelievable this, uh, uh, another historic summit uh, between these two leaders of, of um, US and North Korea uh, in Singapore in June. And they came up with very basic statements still, which included normalization and again, peace regime and denuclearization along with this uh, other nice gesture. And then in the fall, Moon Jae-in uh, went to Pyongyang second summit and uh, his second meeting uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un, which, which he was welcomed you know, with great ceremony, especially one, this one, he gave a speech in front of uh, 150,000 North Korean uh, people in this one of the biggest stadium in North Korea. And this was the first ever North Korea was exposed to South Korean president directly, you know, speaking in front of them, uh, live in person. So uh, this was a quite interesting. And then of course, another important element was they made this first inter-Korean military agreement, uh, which is by the way, very comprehensive. They have about six uh, uh, clause with like uh, all uh, 30 something very detailed uh, 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 contents and planning of uh, about mainly the confidence building measures between the two Koreas, very specific uh, step they are going to take. And in fact, it was a happening. After that agreement, you can see this photo, there's not only two uh, uh, soldiers from two uh, Koreas, but also there's American soldiers standing together in Panmunjom talking about how to uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, make this uh, li literally the Department Jam as a joint security area. You know? uh, and then there's a, uh, another quite symbolic meeting at DMG from the both sides shaking hands. They are blowing up this military post inside the DMG and checking out. This is a kind of CBM confidence again, building measure between the two. And then things, were, things uh, got started. And then if you can remember, this was a third unofficial, uh, sudden meeting between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un at Panmunjom in June last year, right after the Osaka uh, G20 summit. Mm. And this was again quite symbolic because for the first time, these three leaders uh, met together, even though the, the meeting itself was set up for the bilateral uh, meeting the talks between Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, President Moon joined them later. And then there's uh, all kinds of personal, you know, uh, 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 world, uh, nice words, uh, especially coming from uh, Trump to Kim Jong-un, but Kim Jong-un was not happy. What, I mean, not only those nice tweets, we want more concrete step, nothing was going on, then we will, you know, uh, uh, raise some tension. And so he was testing lots of missile over the last poll. But still, uh, these two leaders try to keep a good uh, chem uh, chemistry between at least the personal level, uh, about which the, Mr. Trump was quite happy about and emphasizing. And then, yes, and then there was a, yes, uh, that uh, Bolton resignation. And uh, this is somehow I got it from the, his letter of uh, resignation. Uh, if, uh, given by Bolton to Trump. 
And then now, of course, we have this memoir about a year later. So let me, uh, this is my last, uh, I will stop after uh, saying this. Then what's the uh, important features of uh, President uh, uh, Moon's drive for the uh, summit? I mean, as you saw, we all, this is not the first uh, inter-Korean summit. This is the third time uh, for the South Korean president. But what's the difference uh, this time between these two? Uh, in terms of amount, there has been, it's not only one summit, they met already three or four times, uh, including on un, uh, unofficial meeting at Panmunjom. And uh, their agreement has been also very extensive. Each time they came up with the agreement, but uh, the first summit agreement was only four sentences. Whereas this time, the final uh, agreement, and they came up with the two agreements. One is the Panmunjom Declaration and the Pyongyang also declaration. In each, they have expanded agenda very much. But also qualitatively, as I said, these two Korea was talking about security issues, including denuclearization, like I said. Also, they came up with this military agreement as well which was not uh, uh, happening before. This is uh, for the first time. So there has been some substantial progress uh, in terms of this inter-Korean dialogue. And I think that it is largely thanks to President Moon's kind of quite uh, 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 different uh, push for uh, peace. And uh, his agenda is, first of all, it's not gonna be just an event. He wants to make it as a permanent uh, 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 outcome. So one of uh, he, uh, there are two measures he is trying to take. Uh, he wants to also make those inter-Korean agreements as a, a permanent law on the at least in the South Korean part, with uh, legislation at the South Korean Congress, hmm? which, by the way, is possible at this moment. Why? Because his uh, progressive governing party for the first time in South, South Korea's uh, history took a majority of, of, sorry, in the last election. Gen we had a general election in April in the middle of this pandemic. And during that election, this governing party took up almost two thirds of seat, which means they can pretty much do anything you know, in, when it comes to legislation, including into Korean law or whatever. So that provides a very kind of strong, solid basis for President Moon's what, drive for peace with North Korea. And then also his uh, own popularity, supporting rate by the public itself is very high. You can compare with, uh, at this moment, uh, South Korean term is, uh, President's term is five years, typically, of course, one term. And after three years, you can see all those graphs going down very rapidly towards the bottom, regardless of whether progressive and conservative president. But he's staying very high, around 60%, even at this fourth year, entering into the fourth year of his presidency. I think which will uh, give him a very uh, important uh, political uh, uh, kind of asset to uh, drive his uh, peace initiative towards the north. And of course, what the other, but it's not only up to Moon. The other two also has to respond to Moon's uh, peace initiative. So that is uh, at this moment up in the air, but so far it seems like Donald Trump is interested in keeping a good relationship with Kim Jong-un. And uh, when this is uh, his latest tweet, uh, he, he is so happy that Kim Jong-un is back and well. And, but then everybody is wondering what it, Kim Jong-un is up to. Uh, where is he? What is he thinking? What is going to be his next move? Okay, let me just stop here and I will uh, uh, answer some question or comment. Thank you. Well, wonderful, uh, Dr. Shane Sangho. That is a really terrific um, uh, state of play. 
and I think you've organized it extremely well, the uh, inter-Korean element, North Korea's behavior, where we are. Um, we are developing some questions. I see that Q&A and chat are, so I'll give a couple of minutes, but let me, as the moderator of the session, uh, ask you to say a little bit more about the state of the U.S. Rock Alliance, the U.S.-South Korea Alliance and its relationship. Um, you touched on it, but I, I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more. Um, so if you could say a couple things about that. And the second thing I'd like to ask you is, I was intrigued as a non, as you well know, not a daily watcher of Korea or inter-Korean relations, has North Korea in its most recent, if you will, um, say a harshening position or more assertive position, has it violated any of those CBMs that were indicated in the inter-Korean military agreement that you spoke about? Because I, I was, you made a very interesting statement, is so far in your judgment, they've not taken steps that would lead to a really harsh position. So I was trying to judge what would lead you to the assessment that they've crossed a line, that they've moved beyond uh, symbolic measures. Clearly blowing up the, the Kaesong, uh, you know, communications element was part of it, but has there been any serious violation of an existing agreed upon CBM? So that was a specific question. And the larger question is, where is the U.S. Rock Alliance today? Thank you. And then I'll turn to the questions that are now emerging on Q&A and chat, please. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much for excellent question. Uh, let me answer the, uh, the latter question first. Uh, both yes and no. Mm. Uh, like I said, uh, the, this blowing up of this joint liaison center in Kaesong itself, that was a big uh, achievement, a symbol of inter-Korean reconciliation, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, they uh, intentionally, the North, it seems like they are going to uh, uh, violate all those, uh, or, or undo all those uh, CBM measures. And those are three other, you know, uh, occupying, reoccupying those Kaesong with the military unit or right. uh, uh, sending back those uh, uh, rebuilding of the military post of DMG, Right. If that is happening, that is, that is going to undo all those CBM measures that was agreed upon in Pyongyang, a, a military yeah. agreement also that measures that taken. But now that at, at the same time, and there has been some movement like that. We mm. watched, there is some, but so far also, it's not really happening. We don't see they are building all those military force, forces right now. I see. So I think it's a kind of in between. I see. Okay. Uh, how far? And more importantly, I think even if those all those military uh, couple of symbolic measures are taken, still for me it doesn't uh, rise up to the level of a previous military provocation. For example, we went through a lot of dangerous of course period in before. There was a of direct course. clash between at the sea. They are, they are bombarded Yampyeong Island, Waipido. There has been some military uh, shot fired across the DMG. I mean, mm -hmm. that kind of measure has not been taken yet, or even they have threatened. Of course, even though they say sea of fire in Seoul and all that, but it's, it's just so far it's a rhetoric. Uh, mm -hmm. so going uh, back to your first question of US ROK uh, partnership alliance, I think still by and large, even though in Bolton's, uh, Mr. Bolton's book, there has been some quite interesting dynamics between you know, uh, uh, President Trump and Moon Jae-in and uh, Bolton and other people in between. But so far, what, what is important is, any, anyway, at least among those two leaders between President Moon and President Trump, still, it seems like they're having a very good uh, uh, trust or partnership and sentiment towards each other. Mm -hmm. And so, and also right now, uh, the still, uh, 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 what uh, I mean, for example, when the North Korea blew up those uh, joint region office, South Korean stock market still, we are now going very high these days. And people are not so anxious so far. Why? Because we still believe that the uh, UK, uh, ROK US alliance is very strong and steady. So, that in and itself, I think, is that. Uh, 
in general, the alliance is in, in still in quite stable and good uh, 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 you know, condition so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to the questions that are emerging on the chat section of our uh, Zoom call and the Q&A section. And I am reading these a lot uh, aloud because we have, as you, as I mentioned at the outset, a uh, live recording on YouTube uh, where they cannot see these questions. So I will read them to you, Sun Ho, and I'd okay. be grateful for responses. We do have some time. Sure. Uh, the first question comes from Professor Yoichiro Sato, who is yep. at Ritsumeikan University. And his question is, what is the likelihood that President Moon will inject monetary aid into North Korea to save it from the COVID-induced economic hardship? Does he have strength in domestic politics, obviously in South Korea, to push such a policy through? How would it be done if it is, a, if it is possible? So really a question of further assistance for COVID-related economic difficulties that you alluded to in your right. talk, including food security. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and can you do this politically, given the high approval ratings that you indicated uh, President Moon uh, still enjoys within uh, South Korean politics? Right, right, okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Sato, for a wonderful question. That is very uh, central question at this moment uh, regarding what next, right? And uh, it's, it's also the sequencing could be quite important here. But I think uh, uh, first, there's enough uh, uh, intention and willingness from the South Korean government, in other words, President Moon's part, that he wants to somehow uh, restart, uh, I mean, reconnect with North Korea. And there's, a, of course, already some kind of discussion that uh, maybe if South Korea need to do more or uh, independently out of uh, this UN sanction regime, not violating those sanctions, but under the COVID uh, situation, maybe using the kind of humanitarian calls, uh, we could uh, uh, send some of our kind of medical you know, support and, uh, or, or, or we could send some uh, food uh, aid to North Korea in the name of humanitarian calls. But only uh, the problem was still uh, South Korean government wants to coordinate those uh, efforts with the American side. And that kind of a delayed kind of decision, right? And uh, also there is a, some a practical uh, reason that South Korea, everybody is under the, this, the current uh, COVID pandemic situation. So things could not move very quickly these days. Why? Because mm -hmm. South Korea first, we had to take care of our own pandemic situation. There was mm -hmm. already enough going on in our own you know, economy and society and all that. So I think in a way the inter-Korean uh, relation has been a little bit pushed in, uh, into the kind of secondary uh, issue. And of course there are lots of always important domestic political uh, uh, sequencing. But in general, I think uh, South Korean government has that still uh, very uh, in, uh, enough will and intention, which is, by the way, backed by South Korean public as well. Mm -hmm. But given North Korean behavior, that creates a kind of obstacle for President Moon saying that when, I mean, how can you try to help uh, your friend when those friends is, is, is insulting you, right, and threatening you? That's the kind of, uh, so I think there has to be some kind of just coming out of North Korea first for us to help them. Mm. But uh, what uh, that will, how that will happen is again, up to this German game. And in that process, of course, they will try to coordinate with the United States as, as much as possible. Great. Well, now we have about six, seven minutes left in the scheduled program time. So I do want to get to as many questions as possible. Maybe not everyone. So just to be aware of the time. Um, we now have a question from um, Tenny Christiana uh, of the Pacific Forum um, in Honolulu, our sister organization out in Honolulu, a wonderful organization. And uh, uh, Tenny Christiana asks, uh, given this is a U.S. presidential election year, uh, what is your opinion on um, the U.S. Uh, rock and the South Korea North Korea relations, depending on whether Mr. Trump wins or Mr. Biden wins? What 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 impact, if any, do you expect, given your analysis of the situation? Right. Uh, that's another traffic question. 
but very difficult one for so <laughs> very, very very speculative question right that's right and uh, of course if uh, mr trump still uh, serve his second term i think uh, the momentum will uh, go continue uh, towards this kind of end of Korean War and peace treaty between all those, because I believe uh, President Trump, as Bolton himself said in his book, is very much interested in, you know, uh, having some legacy. You know, this North Korean uh, issue is the one that uh, even no uh, previous president has ever resolved. I'm the only one who could solve this, mm -hmm. right? So uh, as long as uh, uh, Trump has uh, that kind of interest, and I think President Moon is very, very much uh, welcome that kind of uh, approach. And so as long as North Korea responds uh, in, in a reciprocal way, then uh, there's a momentum will again. So there could be a resumption of all those talks and all that. Mm -hmm. What about Mr. Biden? Will he turn things completely backward on 180 degree? I'm, cautiously, I don't think so. Even if Mr. Biden uh, become a president, I think, uh, of course, they will reassess what has happened and those great intention. But being realistic, I think still the general uh, uh, in interest of the United States is the peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, especially in the, this current pandemic situation, right? And economic difficulty. Everybody is, you know, is, is in a in, in, uh, very difficult situation right now. So you don't want to have another crisis popping out in the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So as long as uh, South Korean president, uh, uh, we, which they will do uh, a, a continuously you know, stick to this uh, alliance partnership and the principle of denuclearization. And then I think they can also move on uh, with these uh, talks with North Korean after kind of careful uh, re-evaluation. So which will take some more time than the case of uh, President Trump being re-elected. But I think eventually there will be a dialogue and talks between those three or even including uh, China and six party talks. Thank you. Uh, let me take the next two questions because again, we're just uh, have four or five minutes left. Um, Associate Professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, India, uh, Professor Sandeep Mishra asks, uh, states and then asks, inter-Korea relations are not essentially bilateral. The third party, the U.S., is also part of, the bar, part of these bilateral relations. In such a scenario, do you feel that all the sincere hard work of uh, President Moon Jae-un to improve inter-Korean relations would be successful if the U.S. remains non-flexible or non-constructive. Uh, what you had said was that uh, maybe uh, the U.S. has done quite a lot from your, I mean, in terms of meeting and uh, seeking some relations. But how would you respond to Professor Mishra's question? Right. Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, hi, uh, hello to uh, Sandeep. Uh, we met uh, before in the uh, back in East West Center. <laughs> Oh, and great. anyway, a uh, terrific question. Uh, the thing is, yes, that's another very uh, important uh, debate in South Korea, that uh, South Korea playing uh, a kind of uh, what we call it, uh, driver's uh, role in between the U.S. and North Korea, right? Or mediating mm -hmm. role. Is it possible? Uh, at first, of course, uh, still, uh, U.S. has a very strong uh, uh, leverage in both dealing with North and South Korea. Mm -hmm. And U.S. for some reason is becoming very uh, strong against any kind of inter-Korean dialogue. It will be very difficult for South Korea ignoring that kind of position. Mm -hmm. But like I said, uh, even if uh, whoever becomes a president, I don't think that will uh, be the case uh, for the American uh, government. Second, uh, Another uh, element is uh, as long as United States uh, doesn't really, you know, goes completely against inter-Korean dialogue and peace drive, uh, there will be more, I think, uh, room or leverage for South Korea under the circumstances, given that, uh, again, like due to this pandemic or, mm -hmm. and all that, America will be very busy in dealing with its own issues in, in general in the next coming years. 
they will create, I think, more, more space and room for countries like South Korea uh, mm. to have its own uh, 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 maneuver and uh, uh, voice. And of course, the, like I said, uh, don't underestimate the domestic uh, political landscape that is changing uh, under this current government. That this uh, it's not only President Moon, if uh, the next South Korean election is also won by this liberal progressive party, the, 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 the basis for this inter-Korean uh, reconciliation will be very, very solid at the uh, uh, Korean uh, the domestic level. And I, I think see. that will be a also a very important uh, factor or driver for this inter-Korean uh, uh, relations. Well, thank you for that. And thank you, Professor Mishra, for the question. It's kind of a perfect segue to our, I'm afraid, our last question for the session simply because of time. And that comes from uh, Mr. Andy, Andy, uh, Andrew Eller, who is a young professional program uh, participant with us here at the East West Center in Washington. And uh, he asks, and you alluded to this, but specifically about South Korean public opinion on North Korea in the evolution since in the 70 years. How does their opinion affect South Korean diplomacy and policies towards North Korea? Is there kind of a, clearly there have been zigzags uh, in, uh, in South Korean opinion as in any public opinion, but is the general trend line towards what you're suggesting, which is supporting an ongoing effort to uh, have reconciliation and have some sort of uh, uh, steady basis of relations with the North? Maybe so we'll that's, that. yeah, uh, that's another uh, excellent question. Uh, it also has to do with yes, uh, the, uh, the South Korea's generational change, but also South Korea's uh, political landscape. Uh, you have to be uh, so the, the two. I would characterize those uh, South Korean public opinion in two as a two uh, words. One is very pragmatic approach to North Korean issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, second is uh, they are becoming more and more progressive uh, uh, towards uh, those Korean issues. That means what? Uh, first of all, uh, when I say pragmatic, uh, there's no uh, uh, illusion about uh, unification. I mean, the, the South Korea mm -hmm. just taking over North Korea and everything will be great and perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, so South Koreans are becoming more and more pragmatic when it comes to this unification issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though, yes, still our goal, national goal is eventually we want to unify these two Korea, but maybe uh, not so quickly. Mm -hmm. And the people, uh, general uh, understanding is it will take some time. Mm -hmm. That means what? We have to live with this North Korea for quite a time. But then, of course, the problem is always North Korean regime's character. They are developing nuclear weapon and all that. Mm -hmm. But still, more and more people realizing war is not an option for us. Mm -hmm. So not that we always love North Koreans, what they do, or Kim right. Jong-un. So people right. tend to become, oh, let, let, you know, let, if they want some money, let them just get some money. I mean, we, have, we are rich enough. Huh? Uh, so those, those kind of, uh, uh, in a way, cynicism or uh, sarcasm with very pragmatic approach towards North Korea. And uh, this kind of anti-communist sentiments uh, largely shared by our conservative or old generation is also gone, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, uh, change will, uh, 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 I think is creating a new dynamics in this kind of inter-Korean relations. That's, that's very interesting. I think you've created a new phrase, realistic pragmatism on the part of uh, South Korean public opinion towards uh, relating to the North. Well, on that note, we do have to come to a close. Uh, I wish we had more time, but uh, we uh, always so uh, greatly value, uh, benefit from your wonderful analysis, your thoughtfulness, uh, your well-informed uh, situation there as, as a professor at Seoul National University working with your colleagues and the government. Um, and thank you for bringing us up to date on the situation on this important 70th anniversary as well as 20th anniversary. Um, you know, anniversaries to, for me always bring up questions of trend lines and structural changes. What has changed? What has not changed? What has become better? What has become worse? 
And I think your uh, presentation today was really, really uh, so rich and helpful in, in helping us uh, address some of those questions. So thank you, Sun Ho. Before we formally uh, sign off on the live uh, YouTube stream and on the Zoom call, let me just flag a couple of upcoming programs. The first is to uh, a, a flag for June 29th, um, uh, Eastern Daylight Time, 12.30 to 1.30, that's over the lunchtime, Eastern Daylight Time. When does China's scaring the monkeys strategy work? Which is from our colleague at the National University of Singapore, Dr. Jia Ian Chong. He was an East-West Center fellow, and uh, he'll be looking at China's strategies of scaring the monkeys. Um, on July 7th, we move to another part of uh, East Asia and the Pacific, and that is from our uh, colleagues at the General Accounting Office of the US government, has a new report on diasporas from the Pacific compact states, and it's um, a new book, a new study called Migration to the United States under the Compacts of Free Association. And we'll have the director of the Office of International Affairs and Trade, um, as well as uh, senior economist, Dr. Emil Freiberg and Ms. Caitlin Mitchell, speaking about the role of the Pacific Islands, um, freely associated states and the compact migrations here in the US. And then finally on July 21st, we have Dr. Kai Hay, another former East-West Center fellow, East-West Center in Washington fellow, looking at institutionalizing the Indo-Pacific, um, looking at how this Indo-Pacific con uh, concept is being uh, institutionalized or not in the region. So we have a very rich series of programs coming up, some in our regular pro programming series and some in our 60 minutes uh, for the 60th East-West Center anniversary series of which today, Dr. Sang Ho Shin was the inaugural speaker, and we're absolutely delighted to kick off this program with you. Thank you, Sang Ho. Thank you for all who participated in this program. Thank you to Sarah Wong for having the splendid uh, situation for setting us all up on YouTube and on uh, Zoom, and we look forward to having you with us again in the future. Good day, uh, good evening to you. Thank you for staying up late for those of you who stayed up late in Asia. Good night, everyone. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you so much for all your wonderful question and attention, but also, again, thank you so much uh, for Satu and East West Center for having me for this very great seminar series. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Have uh -huh. a great bye -bye. day. Bye-bye.